Okay, now I'm screen sharing. Oh no, don't do anything, Jao. Don't do anything. <laughs> Anything. Just, uh, just stay put. Just stay put. Okay, Neeraj, shall we start? Uh, give me one second now. One second. I am almost ready. Okay. Then I will welcome first. Okay. Yes, we are live. Yes. Okay. Good evening, friends. On behalf of Pediatric Orthopedic Society, I invite you all to this POSI webinar. We are extremely sorry for the delay. It was because of the technical uh, issue. But now we are, uh, everything is all right. Now I request uh, Dr. Premal to uh, introduce our faculty and start the program. Thank you, Giren Bhai. Uh, we have... Uh... A difficult problem on our hand to solve. We solved the technical glitch very uh, just in time. Uh, so we are gathered today to learn something about CPT. Uh, Sura Professor Tibia comes to our practice all the time and we are not sure who will get the union and who will not get. So today we have got two experts in the field, one from across the globe and one from our, our own, Dr. Benjamin. And they're going to take us through the journey in which they're going to show us how to get through the union of this difficult board to union. Uh, it was 10 years back when Taral and I had an opportunity to listen to Dr. Uh, Alvin Crawford at ICOS meeting. The previous day, uh, we heard him uh, playing clarinet and next day we heard this lecture. It's a wonderful lecture which we cherished uh, over this decade. Uh, he was a guest at uh, POSICON 2013. Uh, we loved his oration. And uh, now I don't want to waste any further time. Uh, Dr. Benjamin Joseph doesn't need introduction to any viewer of this meeting. Uh, Dr. Crawford will start his talk uh, soon. And then it will be followed by Dr. Benjamin's talk. And it will be then followed by question answers in case. Uh, over to Dr. Uh, Crawford. So please start. Neeraj, please ask him to start. Yes, he can listen to you. Okay. Sir, please start. Well, Welcome. Like, good, it's either good morning or good afternoon or good night. I'm not sure. Good evening. I'd like to uh, let you know this is the Cincinnati Children's Hospital where I've worked for many, many years. I have to give my disclosures and my disclosures are my grandchildren because I will give them anything at any time unabashedly. And this is when they were younger. And as they've grown up, I've noticed one thing in the genetics and I call them the chins. If you'll notice that we all have the same chin. So I think the genetics are through, through the second generation. What I'd like to talk to you about is an experience that I've had, and it has to do with an assignment from fellowship from Dr. G. Dean McEwen, and that was to study von Recklinghausen's disease. I found the most difficult aspect of it was anterior lateral bowing uh, of the tibia. And as a result, I've gotten interested enough to study that. My study at the DuPont Institute was in 1974. I was able to write a, a thesis, which was published in 1986, and so I've been in this area 46 years and counting. Uh, I've been very fortunate to be invited to 43 countries to give lectures and to do surgery. And I've been happy with that. What I'd like to talk about is the things that we have discovered and our approaches. In 1986, we started a neurofibromatosis clinic. Again, the problem that we had with it was anterior lateral bowing. And there were 6% of cases that were either dysplastic or pseudoarthrotic, and we noticed forms and there were other involvement. Now, I got sidetracked into the spine as, as pretty much a pediatric spine surgeon, but what bothered me was that we had no answer to this anterior lateral bowing, and anterior lateral bowing became a problem. So management of the tibia was a problem, and I'm going to give you a current observation on where I stand after these years. I don't feel comfortable with the term congenital pseudoarthrosis tibia because the pseudoarthrosis is a fracture, it can heal and it's usually pretty good. Sometimes they're not healed. So I would like to give the first controversy and that would be, I would like to call this congenital tibial dysplasia 
And I know Dr. Joseph has been involved in, con in controversies and we may have some tonight, but it, it is a displeasure. Uh, I'd like to show some of my experiences that I was able to get uh, in visiting you many years ago to see your neurofibromatosis patients in the clinic and see some of the things that had been done. You know, it's always good to see innovations. I saw an innovation, I've seen this once, I've not seen it again, so maybe I'll be able to see it more today or tonight. Now, there have been people who've been interested in this, and you can see the list, which includes Dr. Joseph, who've been interested in the problems of anterior lateral bowing. So I feel that the key points are one, a fracture usually occurs within the first three years, 50% of patients with congenital tibial dysplasia will be associated with neurofibromatosis. They have a better prognosis if they present later, it's a cystic type, or they have a preserved medullary canal. But the most frequent methods of treatment are either cast, brace, intramedullary rod, or one of the other techniques that I'll talk about. The complications are common, including fracture and refracture residual deformity and then tumors, and I'll speak to tumors because of some problems we've had. Now, the current interest is in the cross union, that is tibia fibula, where they state that they've had 100% union. I had 100% union until I started follow-up, in which case I found out that there are many that have fractured. There is a classification. I developed a classification, but it is only anatomic. It does not address therapy. Now, Dr. Paley has a, um, a classification, and it's very similar to the, class, the lanky classification in scoliosis. It has many, many parts, and I, I, hope, I wish him well with it. The natural history of this disorder, which I call a dysplasia, is that we had three uh, had local neurofibromas. They had no increase in CNS gliomas. At one time, it had been reported that there was a higher incidence in neurofibromatosis with tibial dysplasia, that there are gliomas. We didn't find it. Fracture and refracture was common, and there are just so many surgeries that one can have. What are the problems? Limb length inequality, malalignment, uh, and then eventually under, on, uh, underwent amputation. Um, the other thing is that I still consider it dysplasia as opposed to pseudoarthrosis because not all of my fractures have, have, have all of my tibias have fractured, and there is an incidence of uh, other dysplasias. So, for pre fracture management, when this diagnosis is made, we support the patient. When they get to the point of standing or walking age, then we get a KAFO. Uh, if the if there is a fracture, we feel that we should treat them with class with a cast routinely because the cast will give the child some comfort and support. It's not going to heal it. Now, astute arthrosis after fracture should be managed surgically, and I very strongly advocate that, and we'll discuss it a bit. And here's a patient who presented early. This is anterior lateral bowing. Uh, we thought the bowing was increasing, and there was a fibula, so we did a preemptive uh, cast on him. These children don't do well with a cast because the cast becomes unwieldy. So I put them initially before walking into a hip spica cast. Uh, as they get to be a little older, as it develops, one can see this was anterior lateral bowing and fractured in this, this an, uh, a, a hip spica cast because the child is so young. I don't like bracing uh, in the manner that we have the bracing. Because if you use a brace that's a shorter brace, uh, like a, 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 um, that doesn't extend above the femoral condyles, then you allow torsion within the bone. And as a result of that, I've seen them break. Now, this is a patient whose mother went to another doctor because my brace was going to be too overwhelming. And she put this on, and, and I, I don't understand that at all, but I won't go to it. I think that the brace should go above the condyles because if they don't, take a look at this one. One can see that you can rotate the leg in or without the brace. So it's not very effective. And unfortunately, this is a child who's on the poster for the Children's Tumor Foundation. And you can see with the brace the child has, it is actually rotating the uh, fracture site with every motion. 
So what do I think of bracing? It should be above knee after walking. I very, feel very strongly about that because without that, you cannot control the leg. Uh, now, once it has gone to pseudarthrosis, uh, one has a dilemma. And this dilemma is the question, is this an osseous or is it a periosteal disease? Now, if you look at the uh, image that I have here, this is probably as bad as it gets. So when you're faced with that, then you need lots and lots of help and perhaps prayer. So we were able to get some pathological specimens. Now, there is a fibrous hematoma that surrounds a bone and it is associated with NF1 in more than 50%. In the nonspecific, it may be less than that. But the neurofibroma is rarely reported at the site of dysplasia. And so that bothers me into what it is. Now, one study recently has shown that there's a vasculopathy, but there aren't enough cases where the endothelium in that area of this mass, whether it be a fibroma, whether it be a hematoma, whatever, it's abnormal. There's a small vessel lumen disease. The cells support fibrous tissue and fibrous tissue mostly. And so this is a hematoma and this is new information. And I think it's important to, to, to take a look. Now, it's important that we can do something to kill the osteoplast because whether this is a hematoma or whatever is going on, it does cause more osteoclasts and osteoblasts to, do, to uh, function there. One thing that's been tried recently is alendronate to see whether or not the bisphosphonate can give some evidence of killing the osteoblast. Uh, other issues that have come about is a pelvic periosteal uh, wrap and then BMP. And we'll look at all of these. So when we look at the approaches, and this was from this Children's Tumor Foundation, which is a neurofibromatosis foundation uh, consortium. It's your medullary rod, we use electric stimulation and external ring fixator. We've used vascularized fibula. We've used a combination of all of the above with BMP. We've used bone grafts that have been allographic, have been autographic, BMP2. And then the question arises that should you routinely treat the fibula on every particular case? Now, there are newer techniques. There's an induced membrane that the French have talked about. There's a vascularized periosteal graft. Uh, and there's the possibility of stem cells. Now, I think the new kid on the block and the thing that's most exciting is, is the tibia fibular cross union. Now, both Cho and Pele have discussed that and they are, have 100% uh, uh, healing and no fractures. Now, I've had 100% healing, but by God, if you follow them long enough, there have been problems of fractures. So what is the uh, techniques? And this is a myriad of all of them. And I think one thing that's been really good is the uh, Fosse uh, Duval nail, and we've used it for a bit. Uh, so ideal treatment, bone fixation, the breedment of the tissue, be it fibrous, be it uh, hematoma, uh, to have that. And then to create a, a healthy vascular bed, bed for bone repair, uh, to promote osteogenesis and to control overactive bone resorption. Now that's where the bisphosphonates have come in to, uh, uh, to control the uh, resorption. And then do whatever you can to prevent uh, the pseudarthrosis and try to achieve long-term bone health to prevent recurrence. This is the Peter Williams. This is a technique that we've used I think it's important if you're gonna use this, you need a Peter Williams rod. It is special. It has an area that a, a male and female area that you can put it in and maybe get it to be at a level once you've got a good control and a fracture heal, then you can get it above the level of the ankle so it doesn't affect it. The Fosse Duval nail is unbelievably good. It's worked very, very well. But recently there has been an effort to make it even better because once it's healed, it still has a possibility of rotating and being subject to fracture. Now, Dr. Paley has uh, brought in a newer uh, approach in that he has on the male end, he has a hole in it. And with this hole that comes in, he can then line that up in the epiphysis so that he can put a cross wire in 
and the cross wire will give it some stabilization, which means it stabilizes the epiphysis while letting it grow, and we'll see how that works. Vascularized fibula, we've only done several. It has worked very, very well, but there have been patients from away, and we've lost them to follow up. But I think one can see that this is an excellent uh, 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 union. However, we still have the problem with the fibula. This was my first case of platelet-derived growth factor, and sometimes you get lucky on your first case. We used it, and this was possibly the quickest and best healing that I've seen. We've not reproduced that, but it is one case. One case doesn't make a series, and so that worked very well. Now, were we into stem cells before stem cells? I can't say, I can't say just what was going on, but anyway, it was an excellent result. Uh, Bone morphogenic protein, it causes us uh, some issues. We know that it affects healing and makes the healing better, but the downside could be that the gene in neurofibromatosis is one of the strongest tumor suppressor genes, and so I don't know the interaction, and we have to consider that. So when we look at BMP, we have to look at it in terms of treatment of the pseudoarthrosis and then adding a rod. But the thing that's at the back of all of our minds, since we're dealing with children, that a lot of us lose to follow up, the question is that can the BMP be an osteoinductor uh, in the degeneration of a neurofibroma to cause a neurofibrosarcoma? And so that's a problem. Now, the French, and these are, it's a, a, a husband and wife couple who done a, a um, a mechanism of creating a, a pseudomembrane. Uh, this is one of their better cases, of course. What they've done is they've resected the, the uh, area of pseudoarthrosis. Uh, they've done fixation, uh, and then they allow it to develop a membrane, and then they remove the spacer that they put in and fill the cavity with cancellous bone. And I'll show you a case of that. This is a schema as to how it goes. But this is a case, and if you notice, this is with uh, the bone cement there. They leave it in for a bit. They then went in and took it out. Uh, this is at four months. They filled it with bone, and this is the result. And this is just unbelievable. This is as good or better than we've seen. Uh, and uh, I don't know many people who've been doing that and reproducing it. Now, the bay. He was the person who first started to do the two things that I think are extremely important. One, excising the disease to be a periosteum, and then grafting a periosteum. And he took the periosteum from the iliac wing, and this was in an effort to change the biology. And he had initial fracture union in 20 of 20 patients. But just like other things, sometimes follow-up gives you a different vision of what you've done, and that eight of his patients had refracture. What I don't know is that after the paper was written, and then was there more fractures that came as a result of that. Now, a procedure that we did in medical school that I hadn't seen until recently, within the last three or four years, and that is a McFarland. On some of these patients, rather than an anterior lateral bow, there's just a lateral bow. And this child has neurofibromatosis, has a lateral bow. And we were concerned about the bowing of the ankle, that that might give a stress riser. And so we did a metazo screw. And then uh, as she got to be older, I said, well, you know, this might be the perfect case to do a Mc Mc McFarland procedure. So what we did was a McFarland procedure, and it is as stable and as solid as a rock. But in addition, we noticed that there was some improvement from the uh, modification of the angle of the ankle so the metazo screw work and the McFarland procedure work, but more to come. Now, this is a story that sometimes physicians don't realize. This is a child who was seen, and this was after the first five operations. And the attending physicians at that time uh, pulled the, in the, the intramedullary support. And of course, it went to a fracture. This was her sixth operation where the surgeons were aggressive. Uh, they did a resection of the uh, injured area and put a ring fixator and then were able to do a bone transfer. And this is really, 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 really good. But there's a problem with it. And I'll speak to that problem. 
and that is it, it's, it, it broke through the dysplastic bone. So she comes up after that and it continues. Her last operation, uh, it's not the last operation, but on her leg was a below knee amputation. They did a first metatarsal osteochondral allograft onto the tip of the tibia in an effort to prevent the stump overgrowth. It wasn't successful, but she ended up doing well. But this is after, at that time, some 13 operations. So one has to really consider the patient, the parent, and the family. I think the ring fixator is the best technique for salvage. In this particular situation, one can line it up, one can get it into position, one can do the transport, and one can have an excellent result. However, one thing that is more important than anything else, you should never see this, this x-ray on the bottom. And I challenge them to go directly and to put an, an intramedullary stabilization in. I think without that, you're not completed the operation and it's gonna be doomed to failure. And so this is what I feel in terms of what the ring fixator can do. Now, what are some of my pet peeves? The enemy of good is better. And here's a situation where the child has an anterior lateral bow. Some surgeon felt that this was uh, not uh, abnormal bone and went ahead and did an osteotomy. And I think you can imagine what's gonna happen with that. I say that no, never, ever, ever without stabilization to do an osteotomy uh, is just not right. If you have this particular uh, angulation, send it to a friend. I also feel that intramedullary rods without some type of stabilization, stabilization is gonna be the key word as far as I'm concerned for what you do below. You can note that this child didn't weight bear. Look at the osteopenia, the calcaneus. So you're really not getting a situation where uh, it's beneficial for the child. So I think a procedure of only doing this without some type of fixation and stabilization should probably be of historical interest only. What about the other factor? Let's say you've done 10 operations and it worked. Well, the child is then has a limb length inequality. How aggressive should one be? And what are the techniques? What would be the recommendation as to how to do this? Then this, I think, if you're in a center where there's someone really, really good with the ring fixated and able to, to uh, achieve a correction and stabilization, then this is where I think the bone transport. And this is a bone transport. And you can see that it worked very, very well in this case. And you can see in addition to that, there is a Sophia Millar rod. I think now uh, one could use either Sophia Millar if it's available or a, a Fossier, a Paley type in order to preserve this. But I think that if you have a significant uh, limb length inequality and you have the technique and the technology available in your center, this is what should be done. Now, this is a full Monty. This is the Paley that you see it today. And there are several things going on here and I don't know what, yes. And that is one, I talked about the Fossier uh, Duval nail, which he now calls the Fossier Duval Pele, of which he has a hole in the bottom portion where he can put a stabilization wire into the epiphysis, but it is not the growth area and it should be good. In addition, there is a recon plate that's on uh, at the area where he does a tibia fibula uh, attempt at synostosis. And initially there's a screw holding it in place, but once the healing is there, then he takes it away and then he allows that growth. But I think the real issue is that if this continues to grow and it's a problem, you can simply readjust it and place screws across it and use it. But in addition, he heals the fibula. And this is the paleo caution. So where am I with all of this now? Now, I, I've looked at uh, life a little different. And as you get a little further along, you'll probably do that. At Children's Hospital, when I retired, I had some 27,410 patient interventions. Uh, but pediatric orthopedic conditions don't go away with skeletal maturity. And care may not be available for young adults who have pediatric orthopedic problems. So even though most patients function at a near normal level, they need to be seen, but few require surgical intervention. Now, my exposure was from Boston Children's Hospital the San Diego Naval Hospital, the Henry Ford Hospital, 
Cincinnati Children's, a harm study group, and then multiple missionary surgeries, which I've done. So what I developed, because I was going to stay there, was a transition clinic. And that is to allow a person to be able to be seen as a child, be treated at Children's Hospital, but to be seen in an adult facility with someone who had some knowledge of pediatric diseases. And it's an unbelievable uh, opportunity for me. I've seen things that I didn't really see in terms of such things as uh, the fibula involvement and how often it's involved, uh, what's been done, and what can be the final answer. This is a particular child I saw and did the blount uh, epiphyseal uh, correction and then followed that up after being here with Dr. Stevens with an eight plate. Uh, you also get to see some of the results. And this is a patient that was treated by brace only. There are few patients that I've treated for anterior lateral bowing and uh, congenital tibia dysplasia that have been successful. But this allowed me to be around long enough to see a case. Uh, what about your great cases? This is a child who came, you can note that there's an internal stabilizer. He had a uh, valgus. We did a metazo screw. And here, for whatever reason, this was a military family. So they went about and the child started playing basketball. And then he came in with ankle pain. Well, you know what the deal is gonna be here. He has a fracture and it's fractured through the area that was supposed to be good bone. Uh, and it's below the area where the implant stops and that may have contributed to it as a stress riser there. So what they did, they put pins in to stabilize it and send it to us. And we did an open procedure, did uh, bone autograph, allograph, and fixation. The other thing this transitional clinic has allowed me is follow up. This is a child where this was a home run. This was 14 years following the significant fracture of, of a dysplasia, and he was doing well. He was doing so well that he thought it was normal. And as a result, he went out and played baseball one summer, and he slid into second base, and he had ankle pain. Well, needless to say, what he had was a fracture through the bone. And so this was a problem. He had had some operations. Uh, he came in to see us, and we felt that it was reasonable to do, a, um, to do a repair. So we did a repair using BMP. And so I didn't see him for a while. He came in and presented with a large mass of his fifth finger. And we did a biopsy on that after sending him to an oncologist. And he had a leomyosarcoma. So this was the second child that I'd seen where we'd done a procedure using BMP and subsequently presented with a tumor. But the natural history of neurofibromatosis is that they can develop tumors, some malignant in other places. So we did a resection of his finger and he's doing well, but that's 31 years after the first surgery. But I've been in a normal practice situation and not looked back in the transition. We wouldn't have seen this. Another child who presented with a urogenital rhabdomyosarcoma uh, was treated with bracing and did very, very well for 22 years. And then at age 32, she died of a urogenital sarcoma based on the first uh, uh, condition that she had. And then you see some things that are really unusual. I saw this child in 1979 and had little knowledge of what neurofibromatosis was all about. Used a rush rod, uh, it stabilized. We had to cut the tip off because it was bothering him on the anterior tibia. And he did well until until he had problems. He had problems as an adult. Fortunately, one of my associates was in the office and we've done uh, procedures that I wouldn't have thought would have worked in neurofibromatosis that have worked so far for him. So let me conclude this. The treatment is difficult. I recommend cast, early bracing and continuous bracing I think that if they have a fracture, then my operation for the young child still is a Peter Williams rod. If you can get the Peter Williams rod with a male and female in, that allows you to take it out of the ankle. I think a bone transfer and external fixator is extremely important. If you have someone on your staff, uh, such as I have on my staff that can do this, then can get your line. We've also done bone transfers uh, but more important, as I stated early, is the IM rod, because 
as stable as it is, it is not normal bone. And I feel that the iron rod will protect it. Uh, vascularized fibular grafts are really good. I, I've not seen or done enough of them, but they've worked in the ones that I've seen. Um, adding other elements to take care of problems, such as a bisphosphonate to maybe cut down the osteoblast, to increase their bone produce, production with vitamin D and elemental calcium. I think it's worth it and pro, would recommend it on every patient. Uh, I'm not I'm, I'm not completely comfortable yet because I've not seen enough, but I am really intrigued with the uh, tibia fibular cross union because as far as I'm concerned, that represents that in addition to all of the above, uh, meaning all of the other techniques that are going on with it. And then finally, when you see a child who's had 14 operations, then you wonder who is being treated, the child, the parents, or the physician, and one has to make a decision and I think that decision has to be made and you have to be prepared in the consenting process to make the parents aware of it. You can see in this little child, regardless of what uh, type of treatment and how benign it is, it can still be fairly stressful. So at the end of the day, if you have a child that's gonna be in a prosthesis like this, then one has to consider amputation. I feel that after you've heard all of the lectures today and all of the lectures in any uh, symposium that you'll attend, that the dogma of today is a myth of tomorrow. I, I have problems uh, accepting a 100% healing followed by absolute zero refracture. Uh, I think, uh, and I, I hope that there are fellows in the audience and trainees and residents, uh, it's important in their training to hitch their wagons to a star. Uh, my two stars were John Hall and Dean McEwen, who were my mentors. And this is Dean McEwen, who still mentors me, and it's now some 47 years later, and I take his advice as well as I did when I was a resident. Uh, I apologize, and I'm sorry that I can't play my clarinet for you today. I'm used to doing that and would love to do it, and it's a joy to do it. But I think the most important thing is to be able to talk to you and to share my uh, contributions and my thoughts on the treatment of congenital tibia dysplasia, which results in a pseudoarthrosis. And I thank you very much for your kind attention. So you will have to unmute. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Joseph, can we start your presentation, sir? Uh, Dr. Crawford, can you stop sharing your share screen, please? Yes. Dr. Joseph, would you start sharing your screen, please? Hello. Yes, sir. Please start your screen share. I beg your pardon? Please share your screen. We are starting your presentation, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not going to use a, okay, so I, I'm just going to talk. So can you hear me? Yes, sir. Perfectly. Okay. So I, I, I think uh, no talk on pseudarthrosis tibia could have been more comprehensive than the one that I'll give us. And I think it would be redundant and superfluous to go through uh, the different aspects of treatment but I'm only going to do two things. One is talk to you about two things that I contributed to. One was a review article in uh, uh, 2013, along with a colleague called Tahir Khan, who was a consultant in the United Kingdom in Manchester and has since moved to London. Dr. Joseph, Tahir, we cannot see your screen yet. You, you can't? No, you can't we cannot see your page. screen. There is no we, PPT, Niraj. Huh. He's just no, talking. No. Achha, okay, sorry. So, Dr. Joseph, we have already shared your work uh, today with all the members. So, they are already aware of your article. Is that okay? Can you see me now? Yes. Yes, sir. Very please, well. please go ahead, sir. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Tahir and I, Tahir invited me to write an instruction review for the British JBJS, which was since, uh, since then called the Bone and Joint Journal on controversies in the management of pseudarthrosis tibia. 
And I think Al has touched on this several controversies. And unless we address these controversies, we may continue to make the same mistakes again and again. Early in my practice, when I started operating on Sudat Rusul Tibia, I used to operate with them as and when they, I, they, they came to me. And many of them happened to be two years, three years old, and so on and so forth. And then the uh, EPOS review, European Pediatric Orthopedic Society, did a multi center study, and they reviewed their treatment of Sudat Rusul Tibia. And they came up with a very, very strong recommendation. And this recommendation was, do not operate under the age of five. This was a pretty strong uh, recommendation. And it was repeated on more than one occasion in that article. And here I had been operating on children before five, you know, ignorant about this view because the review had not come out yet. But the interesting thing is when I went back and looked at the results, the results were good. So I, I published an article on that. Now, the important thing that you must read is, realize is what the European Pediatric Orthopedic Society was, did was they looked at the different methods of treatment that they were doing. And there was no one doing intermediary rotting. Majority of them are using Elizarov. And what they showed was Elizarov functioned extremely badly in very young children. And that is what made them make that suggestion. On the other hand, when we use intramedullary rods, the, the, the results are not as bad. So that was one of the controversies that we dealt with. And I wrote some, an article which was diametrically opposite to that. So here are two views. On one hand, someone says, don't operate before the age of five. And here's someone saying, there's no harm in doing it. But you must be able to understand the difference because one person is doing the Elizabeth the other person who's doing tremendous erotic. So you must be discerning enough to understand what you're reading. The second issue that uh, intrigued me was I'm a lazy chap. I'm not like uh, Al Crawford, who's very hardworking. So when I was confronted with a sudatrosus tibia, I meticulously excised this soft tissue hamartoma, fixed the tibia, and went home. I did nothing about the fibula because I thought, well, it doesn't matter. And this was my practice throughout where I didn't do anything to the fibula. And here comes Charlie Johnson who says that you must fix the fibula. And he categorized surgery on the fibula as three different types and showed that the results are best if you operate on the fibula. And I didn't operate on the fibula. And my results were not bad. So I went on to, con to, to contradict Charlie Johnson and say, well, you're getting good results, but so am I without touching the fibula. So here was another issue of controversy. The next controversy was, I, when I came into this picture and started doing this difficult surgery, I rationalized and said, we know that the hamartomatis tissue has got a preponderance of osteoblasts, I mean osteoclast, which I alluded to, and a very few osteoblasts. So, when you look at a grafted area and the graft fails, what happens? You get a complete dissolution of the graft. The graft disappears. You put in some fantastic graft and you, after some time you find that there's no graft there. It's dissolved. And we know from simple early practice of orthopedics that when you put in cortical graft, it resolves more slowly than cancellous graft. So keeping that in mind, I started using cortical graft from the opposite tibia. Now, there aren't many people who, who do that, but I like it particularly because you can re-harvest the graft after two or three years if your fracture recurs. And we've had ex excellent remodeling and reconstitution of the tibia. We published an article in, in, in the journal which shows that the morbidity after taking tibial graft is not bad. In fact, it's negligible. We had a lot of support from a spine surgeon. Can you imagine? Jean Dubay, Jean Dubesset, who uses cortical graft and says it's fantastic. So I'm one of the peculiar guys who use cortical graft, but it works exceedingly well. 
So here a thing is controversy that you're finding. What type of bone graft should you do? When should you operate? If you do operate, what should you do to the fibula? Now, each person who advocates a particular thing says that that particular intervention adds to the success of surgery. It may be so, but how would we know unless you analyze it? For example, Draw Bailey now advocates periosteal grafting. It's nothing new. We reinvent the wheel. A hundred years ago, Codvilla suggested it. But I don't see Codvilla's name in, in, in the current literature. But Codvilla had done it hundred years ago. He said that the periosteum is abnormal and grafted periosteum. Okay, so if you look at the article of, of Draw Bailey, in addition to the periosteal grafting, he's put an in intermetallin in the aid. He's used an elizorol. He's used BMP. He's used bone grafting. Five things. Now, which of these has contributed to the union? You see, so be discerning when you read articles. And how are you going to answer this question? Which helps? We need to do more elaborate studies. Unfortunately, the pseudathrosis tibia is not that common that you see hundreds of them. Al has been fortunate to have a fantastic number. My personal series, when I was working at Kastupo Hospital from where I retired, was 56 cases that I did personally. That itself is a very large number. But it is too small to draw conclusions as to whether one form of treatment is better than the other form. So this led me to accept that there were many controversies. And I concluded that review by saying it is imperative that we do multicenter studies. And it took me five years after that to do a multi-center study where I invited people from different parts of the world and a few of them were gracious enough to join me. And we looked at only one type of pseudarthrosis, Al Crawford's type four, established pseudarthrosis. And we looked followed up to skeletal maturity. We were very strict about the criteria for selection. Crawford type four, operated in whichever way you want, but followed up to skeletal maturity. So that it gave us, gave us a, a clearer picture about refracture. It gave us a clearer picture about what happens to the outcome in terms of the shortening, associated deformities of the ankle and so on. And we did a study which entailed sophisticated uh, statistical analysis of two types. Okay, uh, multivariate, analysis and another form of analysis which is called recursive partition. We collected 119 cases and I thought that's fantastic. 119 cases should give us answers but to our disappointment even 119 cases were far too inadequate for us to answer the questions that we were asking. What are the reasons for union? What are the factors that facilitate reunion? What are the factors that help in avoiding refractors? We couldn't answer that question. So now what is, it, what is the best way around? I have now retired and I'll, I don't think we can contribute too much more. So what is the answer? In that paper, I said this is that we form a registry, an international registry. And I'm happy to say that the international registry has been launched. It's a collaborative effort between my institution, my former institution in India and Vancouver uh, Children's Hospital the, uh, of British Columbia. And the, uh, these, what do you call it? The registry is up and running. And I would urge each and every one of you, even if you have just one case or two cases, get onto the bandwagon, contribute to the understanding please contribute your cases. And if you want to, to uh, find out whom to go to, please contact Hitesh Shah, hitesh Shah 12 at gmail.com. And he will tell you how to contribute to this registry. We may not have the answers, but I think we can get the answers if we honestly contribute to the registry. And in, in times to come, I think we'll have answers. I immensely enjoyed listening to you, Al. It was wonderful to reconnect with you. As you notice, both of us have aged since we met each other last. I have retired fully and I do no more clinical practice. 
I do some writing and other things. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you've learned something from this. Thank you. Appreciate your talk. Could you hear it clearly? I can hear you clearly. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Right. So we both have enjoyed listening to you, your wisdom. And we have some question answers in some cases. Uh, so I'll start the, um, Dr. Joseph, please uh, stop sharing your screen. screen. So I'll start the uh, presentation. And Dr. Bino, show the first case. Memories. Yeah, so good evening, everyone. And it was really nice listening to the uh, uh, pearls of wisdom from this uh, for this complex problem of congenital pseudoarthrosis of tibia. But this complex problem sometimes become more challenging when you have such young children who present to you after undergoing previous surgical treatment elsewhere that has failed. So this is a case of a four-year-old male child with case known case of neurofibromatosis with left-sided congenital pseudoarthrosis of tibia. At the age of two and a half years, next, Premal. Premal, can you? Yeah. So he had undergone treatment with excision of pseudoarthrosis, illusorov, bone grafting, and a proximal corticotomy when he was at the age of two and a half years. Next. May, may, may I interrupt you at this point? Yes, yes, sir. In, in, on the basis of what I just mentioned, and on the basis of the EPOS study, Yes. What are your comments about intervening at two and a half years with an Yes. Yeah. So as you rightly said, two and a half years is a very young age, especially if you're planning to do an illusor of that too without any intramedullary rod. So uh, if you are doing illusor, I think you should wait for beyond three to four years because children at this age with very small atrophic bone do not tolerate it well. And plus this surgeon had not even supported it with an intramedullary nail. So I think uh, this was bound to fail. What is your opinion, sir? Uh, that's what I anticipated. And the yeah. sad thing is, if you look at the bone structure in this x-ray, which is where the Elizarov is done, it's yes. far better than what it is now. Yeah, yeah. So that's so, what this was. So we have done some disservice by doing that surgery. So I think we need to be discerning. Yeah. So this was not done by me. This was, this is, I'm just no, telling. No, no, no. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not. not yeah, so we are learning from this. Yes. So in, uh, on top of that, he had done a corticotomy uh, 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 above and the proximal tibia trying to lengthen it. And then he sustained a supracondylar femur fracture and the, the ring was extended above. And then finally he developed so much infection and the fixator loosened. So the surgeon decided to remove the elicero and put him in a cast. And that was the X-ray on removal of elicero. And current situation is next premal. Yeah, so this is the current status where you have a non-union persistent at the distal site. And now we have a very, very short atrophic distal fragment. There is recurvatum in the proximal tibia. There's significant shortening, more than five centimeter. If you can see the level of the ankle, which is almost compared to the opposite side at mid leg level. So this is a complex problem now. As you rightly said, to start with, it was much better. And there's a similar case, one more case, a young child, again, a case of five-year-old child who had a failed attempt at you, of union with Elizar at the age of three and a half years. Even he had done a corticotomy and that also failed to uh, unite. And now this was the picture with two sides of non-union, a very narrow medullary canal and an atrophic bone and again, significant shortening. So now we have such complex problems and I'm sure most of my colleagues will agree that we do get such patients referred to us after undergoing primary treatment somewhere else and not doing the right treatment. So these are two cases with failed previous treatment and we have certain questions as to what to do now. What should be the choice of treatment now? What implant should we use? Especially in the first place where you see that the distal fragment is very, very atrophic and once you excise the pseudoarthrosis, there's going to be further shortening. And we've already discussed about the ideal age for surgery. And uh, we should also understand what, what should be the ideal age for Elizaro. And like these surgeons did, whether it was advisable to do lengthen simultaneously in such small children or should we do lengthening at a second stage? 
and as dr alvin crawford rightly said is there any role of amputation we have so many advances now but what what is the current recommendation of amputation so i would like both the uh, experts to give some comments on these two cases i think that one thing we we really got to consider is what dr joseph has said if we're going to do these case reviews and case studies and put out information that has passed multifactorial analysis that is if that is com completely true and right we we have to pay attention to it because if the european study comes out and they can show categorically with multiple participants that to operate a child and especially a ring under 5 is going to be doomed to failure and this is why you notice my last slide the dogma of today is the myth of tomorrow but one has to look at the fact that this is good information so the the one has to consider that but once you get here then the consenting process i think the most important conversation between a patient family and physician is the consenting and that is that they understand now I started something years ago which was probably not good but I had a rule of 3 we would make our best three attempts after which this child would live forever thinking about all the operations I showed a child with 14 operations and I don't know whether that starts you off as a good add on I don't know but I don't think it does so I think taking advantage of the material one the studies they have to have similarities but if the studies prove a particular issue then i think we as as practitioners have to sort of look at it because this child the one that i see on my screen now in addition to having severe problems with the tibia and fibula the all of the fasces are pretty much closing are closed so uh then would you have to do another uh a uh, uh, transport and it be just at some point one has to say to the parents i You know that this child may or may not have a better lifestyle if the child underwent a conversion to amputee, and then their life would be based on their brain, their upper extremities, and their function, rather than the hospital visits, the doctor, the next operation. But I think you have to lay that down early in the consenting process. That's why I go into three, because after five, then the mother and the father have gotten into it. They value you. They came back to you. They like you. They know that the next time is going to going to be good, and that's a myth. And then maybe the next time is good, but unfortunately, not as Dr. Paley has. I have refractors of our perfect results. So this is why I want to really emphasize. I think this is a dysplasia of bone. It is not just a pseudoarthrosis, and we have to agree with that. So I I I, I think after the rambling oration. Uh, my opinion is a combination of all of that but think about consenting that you and the family understand this and it's not your good or your bad surgery because there's always the other opinion that they'll go to and want this and that and be aware of it that this is not a good disease and then the later part of my life in the transition clinic in seeing some of von Recklinghaus's generation of tumors that occurred in these patients and that was before BMP or any of the things that we're using now can occur so you want to add life to their years as opposed to years to their life in terms of taking this off Dr. Benjamin Dr. Joseph and uh, Dr. Joseph and, uh, and Dr. Crawford we have a similar question uh, that if you had get a one year old child with uh, frank sudo arthrosis how long would you wait Dr. Jayanth has asked this question If I had a one year a one year old child I put them in a cast and see to see what what will happen I I put them in a cast and give them some time but now I what I said about the cast is true I think in a child they've got baby fat they've got everything almost anything you put on them is going to have a tendency to rotate and so where is it going where is the stress going to concentrate it's going to focus in the disease segment and so you're actually perhaps injuring that so if you're going to go with a cast and i parents like a cast it's hard to tell a person first on you're going to operate on their child they have to be with you you have to get adjusted to them and them to you and letting them know is so i i i use a hip spiker because i think that's the only way that i can control it So as a one-year-old, I'd have no problems whatsoever putting the child in a hip spiker. 
So, sir, if you have a patient who has already got a fracture and a one-year-old, what will be the best time you would uh, operate? How long would you keep the child in Greece? Well, I'd have to see what it's doing. If it was, if a mobilization is showing some evidence of osteogenesis, meaning that I see some callus and so forth there, then I'm comfortable with that. I might go with that for a bit. Um, I I. I don't have any problems doing an intramedullary rod in a child under five. I do have a problem with, with the ring fixer because it, it has its own problems of the weight distribution and so forth. And so I would say you, you want the child, you have to think of anesthesia, you have to think of a lot with the child and you can carry them along. Um, I like the European uh, concept. I, I would think that even with a Peter Williams rod, uh, the child has to be at least three to five years of age for me to operate on them. Joseph? One, one question I would like to ask. Uh, can we just go back to the lateral x-ray? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, both these cases, if you see, you know, a finding which I have consistently observed, if you look at the knee joint, uh, you know, consistently we observe that the tibial slope is reversed. Yes. And also there is a posterior sag of the knee, you know, and this is a finding which I have seen and I have no explanation for that. So any comments, Dr. Benjamin, as well as Dr. Crawford, you would like to offer? Have you had similar observations? Abnormal tilt of the tibial physis has been reported along with the bowing of the proximal tibia, the recovatable proximal tibia. All these are features when you leave the pseudarthrosis uncorrected for a long period of time. So it, it, it is well described. Yes, there are these problems. Regarding the, uh, if you see a child at one year with a fracture, I do exactly what Al said, either put a cast or use an above knee brace, but certainly above knee, a clamshell and keep them going till they're about two and a half or three at least before you do anything. Because, you know, even, for example, I, I take uh, the opposite tibia. You don't want matchsticks, you want some graft. So you want that bone also be, to be a little better. So we, we bear, buy time. And when the child walks on it, uh, on that uh, cast with the limb in the proper position, actually the osteopenia is much less. So I'm happy to, to buy time, delay it till about three if I can, uh, and operate at that point of time. Regarding lengthening of the tibia, which you had asked about, I don't see any urgency about lengthening. If you can get the, the tibia to unite, let's achieve one of the major problems, deal with it first. We can always correct the limb inequality later. If it turns out that the limb inequality is less than five centimeters, we can do a contralateral epiphysiodesis. It's very easy to do. So why jump in and try to do everything together? You know, I, I think we tend to be a little more humble you know, we get forced to be more humble when we have these failures. Get it to unite first, and then think of the 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 limb length, right? So at least in ankle deformities, so don't try to correct everything in one go. You can't put more and more rings, yeah. but I think that's asking for something. Yeah, so I think lengthening finally, small, small finally, children we must. So no, yeah, sorry. While lengthening later, the proximal tibia is perfectly safe. I've done it on several locations and had no problems, but wait till everything else sorted out and then do the lengthening. The proximal metaphysical uh, lengthening is perfectly safe. There was a French author who suggested that you must do it on the length of the femur, but that's really not needed. You can lengthen the tibia without any problem if you're careful about it. But try, try not to be too, too hurried in the lengthening part. Go a little slow. Yeah. Okay, so let's move to the second case. Uh, this is a little rare case. So this was a 15-month-old child who came to me in 2012. The father has Van Rattling Hussein's disease and this child has a frank uh, signs of neurofibromatosis. So uh, Dr. Joseph, what would you do if the child comes to you with this x-ray 15 months old? Probably this is the x-ray at uh, almost birth and this is the x-ray at 15 months. So how would you treat this child, sir? You're asking Al the question? No, sir. No, you, yes. no, me. I'm sorry. 
Yes. I, I, I don't think, I mean, first of all, let me say that it is exceedingly unusual to have bilateral sword arthros of the tibia. Yes. In the entire series that I've had, it's a, just a couple of bilateral cases. So uh, it's unfortunate. So if you if you're in the vicinity of Al Crawford, send it off to him. <laughs> actually, uh, this boy was operated when Dr. Crawford was in India. Actually, uh, <laughs> you're going to do it yourself. Uh, no. so the rules are exactly the same. If you had the going before the tibia, do exactly what Al would do: brace it. The, the right side also brace it till it's old enough for surgery. The good thing about it is that the pseudarthrosis is more in the mid shaft rather than the lower third. So you've got a good run of tibia in that the fractured part. So hopefully a good intermediate rod should work. When you're confronted with a very short distal tibia, there's no option other than going, you know, transfixing the ankle and the subtalar joint. Right? I mean, I do that routinely. I make no apology about it. So I follow you, sir. This child the early explanation or something. Can we go back to the early? Yes, this is this is unusual to have bilateral to begin with, as Dr. Joseph said. But you know, if you look at this, this looks like a lateral bow that has responded to uh, a McFarland. Yeah. And that's not getting into osteotomies or anything. Uh, but one can see that this is disease bone, but it's just something to think about. This is an extremely unusual case. Uh, I don't think we have one in our material of a symmetrical, uh, both, both lower extremities. We, we don't have that. So this is extremely unusual. And may I ask you, what graft do you use for the, for the McFarland's? Where do you take the graft from? Normally, I take it from the, uh, the tibia. Dr. Benjamin Joseph, he couldn't hear you because I had muted him. Can you just repeat the question for yeah, him? I didn't hear what you said. I, I'm sorry. Uh, what for did a, you do? Uh, for a McFarland, where do you take the graft from? Oh, no. I use an allograph in the McFarland. Okay. Allograph. Oh, yes, yes. And and it is healed in, in very well, yes. At what age would you choose to do a McFarland? And uh, is there an angulation beyond which you say that this angulation is too severe and I would rather, you know, correct it or you would never correct a pre pseudoarthrotic tibia? Uh, my feeling now is that every pre pseudoarthrotic tibia, meaning with only congenital dysplasia with no fracture and pseudoarthrosis, everyone that I've seen that has been a pre approached electively has not resulted in a good result, has been a failure. I think you want to stay as far away from injuring that bone if it's not injured on its own. As I said, I've seen now actually some of these that have healed. I never saw that before. So I, I would say if it, if it was not a pseudoarthrosis uh, and it was just a fracture, I would, give, I would give cast a chance. I would put it in a cast and see what happens. But I would be aggressive with my casting, meaning to get everything immobile by putting it into a hip spiker cast and see what happens. If I saw any of it, and I would do the other things. I would put them on, I would increase their vitamin, their calcium intake. Uh, I don't feel comfortable enough in a young child to put them on bisphosphonates yet, but I would do everything I could to make them as healthy as possible and then see what would happen. But I would not electively correct it just because it's been. And you might consider McFarland at what age? Crawford, can you hear us? I can hear you now. Yeah, sir. What what will be the earliest stage when will you will you do McFarland? Can you repeat the question? What is the youngest age you have done McFarland, or you would suggest McFarland? Uh, the child would still have to be four or five. It wouldn't be in a child this young. As I said, this was an opportunity with bilateral. I've not seen this, but in the McFarland, they, they should be at least five or six. Uh, and it's going to be unusual that you will see a more lateral than anterior lateral bowing. And so the case is very, very, very limited that you would do them and see them. So um, I had given him plaster for a while, then changed to brace. 
and uh, it was when the child was about three years old. Uh, I did the procedure what Dr. Benjamin has recommended. Uh, that is his early follow up, and this is his six year follow up. And I have done about uh, two revisions of K wires. And this child has uh, still the same deformity, and he's braced uh, this way. And um, father is not very keen on getting the surgery done, but this child is perfectly mobile. He is doing all his daily activities, and uh, he does not have any issue now. So, how to proceed from here? So you only did one side. Yes. Where I see on the, on the X-rays in front of me, I see the Boeing and I see the uh, the other. You you operated on both sides, or is this an? A it's only patient? one side. Right side is operated. The left side is in brace, and the child is comfortable with the brace. Okay, fine. Well, the enemy of good is all times better. My, my concern now is the one that's operated. I feel uncomfortable with the, with the prominence of the pen uh, as a stress riser that it could injure and would fracture in that area. So at this point in time, if the father was, was up for it, then I would be more inclined to want to do an instrumentation that would give me more control above for the entire tibia. I worry now that that would be a stress riser at the end of the of pen, approximately. Yes, sir. he's uh, actually he's posted for uh, he will be posted for the change of K wire soon. I'll just remove it from the heel and re unnail it. Doctor Joseph, your thoughts on this? On the I, right I, side I, as well as there, are, there are two two things. One is exactly uh, what uh, uh, Al said. The tip of that nail uh, wire is hitching on the cortex, and that's not a safe place uh, to leave it. Yeah. So the second is you've got the hook, uh, I mean, the uh, nail crossing the ankle and subtalar joint. So you can revise it very easily, put a nail without a hook, and tap it across the ankle, and see that it goes up to the pro proximal metaphysis. So you've got a rod that's in there, the ankle is free, and starts moving. Yes. Yeah. You, you can see there's porosis already in the ankle. Uh, one question. If you look at uh, the fragment, I mean, it is the tibia is already bored, and you might not be able to get an intramedullary nail. Would you consider an osteotomy in that case in order to put the, the uh, nail? Uh, yes. The, on occasion where we have encountered that problem, we have done an osteotomy and grafted it exactly as we would if we were doing a primary oh. sort of so, sir, in those cases, would you fix it with a plate or you will just uh, rely no, on no. the... One I thing I have it. never done is use a plate. I have never used a plate in Suda. Now, there's no fancy, fancy plates are coming now. Yes. But the principle that I follow is pathological bone requires an intramedullary rod, which is coaxial yes. to the bone. That's so my... So Sorry? how do you decide the amount of uh, what to excise and at what level to stop? You, you mean of the pseudarthrosis? Yes, sir. The fifth question here. During surgery, how do you decide the extent of hematomatous periosteum excision and to the extent of the healthy bone? So what well, is the As far as I'm concerned, I don't excise too much of bone. Till I get a little bleeding, I nib nibble the two ends. But I'm very radical about the circumferential excision of the thickened periosteum and the, the uh, hematomatous tissue. So I'm very aggressive about that, but as far as bone is concerned, I'm fairly, fairly conservative. I don't excise two, two, two centimeters or three centimeters. I just nibble the tips, get a little bleeding, but I'm much more radical about the soft tissue resection. Dr. Crawford, anything you wish to add here? Well, I'm intrigued by something that I've not done, and that's the attempt to uh, cause a cross union. Uh, I think there's there's value to it, but in a situation like this, there's not enough fibula to give you much of a of a of a cross union. There, you would have to you would have to instrument and fuse both. So I I I do exactly as Dr. Joseph. I take the bone back to where it bleeds freely, and I feel that that's it. And then from that point. And again, my my generation, we've used uh, we've used uh, allograft and we've used BMP. 
Uh, I've not gone into the pelvis to get pelvic bone. Uh, you can get a lot of it. And that might be, I, I think like everything we're saying is an evolution. And I think we might be evolving into that. Uh, and the things uh, 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 with the evolution would become uh, autologous graft and uh, a cross union. Uh, I, I don't have a personal experience though. So that's a, there's a question from Dr. Thomas. He asked that how many attempts with what both of you would give with rush rodding and bone grafting before you turn on to procedure like Elizaro, vascularized fibular graft? I, I didn't get that question. So how, how many attempts of rush rodding will you do before you proceed for either Elizaro or a vascularized fibular graft? I don't, I don't think I can give you a number. You see, if, if it looks to me like a situation of three, <laughs> I'll, I'll say three. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if, if, I, if I think that it's a type of bone that might behave with an Elizarov, I'll suggest that. Or if I think that it needs to be excised fully in that area, then think of aspirate fibula. So it, it's my, a my, case to case decision. My problem is. My problem is that hope springs eternal. And when you bring it back initially and the mother sees it and it's going so well that then you want to say, well, let's give it another try. And no, no, I think it's going to do something in three or then maybe we should think of the child because all of this we're doing to the child. We're not thinking about the fact that they're away from their friend, they're in a big cast, they have their gun to go major surgery and I'd like for them to get on with their life. I'll, if I may uh, comment, I've been fortunate that in my career, patients that have followed up with skeletal maturity, none of them have been amputated. And I don't attribute that to super surgery. I've been lucky. Here is the thing that I found out in the transition clinic that's so important is that follow up. You know, I don't know how many great results, I mean, perfect results at five years of age that I've had that are somewhere now amputated because they, they, they refractured, were seen by another physician, another surgeon, amputated, and they're on with their life. So I don't know that. And this is why I can say, I could never say non-fractured, non recur because now that I've gotten in this situation where I can look at the other end, we lose patients pretty much by mandate in some situations at 18 years of age. And by God, we all know that you've just begun life at 18. Uh, Al, if I may point out something which is important for the other listeners. There is a difference in the culture in the United States and India, for example. You mentioned that two of your children, one went to play baseball and the other went to play basketball. That is unlikely to occur in India. A lot of the children are content to avoid some of these contact sports or uh, so, so there is a difference. So the demand of what they want is slightly less. And so it's a little easier for us. So if you, for example, if you have a stiff ankle, it's not a big issue for them. The second issue that I want to mention is we need to be a little cautious about our threshold for amputation in areas where prosthetic services are not good. You see, because, me. So if, because if the prosthetic services are not good, then you are left with an equally bad situation where the child can't function well. So you need to balance these couple of things when you're thinking about it in, of children from less privileged societies. So sir, we move on to the, our last case. Uh, that's from Sandeep. Yes, Sandeep, please go ahead. Yeah. So uh, this was a nine years old girl who had uh, who had all signs of neurofibromatosis. She had cassiole spots. There was a family history of uh, you know a father having you know multiple cutaneous uh, lumps, but she was not aware of the diagnosis of uh, neurofibromatosis. She had a mild anterolateral bowing, which hadn't given problem till date. But now of recent onset of about 15 days before presentation to us, she had sudden onset pain and inability to bear weight on the right lower limb. 
and uh, you can see over here that you know she had an anterior lateral bowing which has now progressed to a frank pseudoarthrosis uh, next slide please so uh, i think the first question we have already discussed is that how do you decide the extent of hematomatous excision and the bony debridement uh, dr benjamin sir he already uh, explained his approach to the fibula uh, dr uh, uh, Crawford, what would you like to do may, about may, the fibula? May, you know, may I interrupt you at that point? Yes, sir. There's one exception to the rule. If the fibula is intact yeah. and you've excised some of the tibia, it's imperative that when you do an intermediate rotic, that the two fragments of, of the tibia must be in contact. If yeah. they stay apart, it just will not unite. So it's important that the two ends are coapted. And coaptation of those two ends of the tibia will not take place if you got an intact fibula. In that situation, yeah. osteotomy is available. So that is one situation where I do operate on the fibula. It is to make sure that the tibial fragments are in absolute contact with one another. Okay, sorry. I'll, I'll I, I agree with everything you've said. As a matter of fact, this is possibly the most ideal question. I mean, ideal case that I've seen today. The child is large enough, they're old enough, the fibular canal is adequate, the tibia. This is a case that one could do and feel comfortable with doing. And, uh, and the answer, because to get the best result uh, out of, uh, uh, of my coaptation, I have to atomize the fibula one way or the other. There's others, we used to do an oblique ostectomy, uh, osteotomy at a level, just simply so that there is not a restraint. The, if the fibula is intact and the tibia sh is short, then that's doomed to failure. So you have to make an adjustment there. But I think now, rather than just an oblique osteotomy, I put an oblique osteotomy of the fibula with an intermedullary nail, but all of my uh, interest would be concentrated on getting the most perfectly aligned tibia. This is a case that I would want to have, would want to do, and I think this, the age, the size, uh, with the instrumentation we have, would give this child the best result. This case we would never send to you, we'd keep it ourselves. <laughs> I'll, we would never send this case to you because we'd keep it ourselves, it's the best one to have. <laughs> Here, let, one question let me tell you what, coming this, yeah, this, so you this is beautiful. This is what I would have done maybe five years ago, and that is an osteotomy of the fibula. At this point in my life, I would do an ostectomy of the fibula, rot it, and put this, the bone that I took out into the graft site. Do you, do you see where you've got the overlapping fibula? Yeah. And you would do it at the same level, at the level of the pseudoarthrosis, the fibula osteotomy? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Can we move to the next thing? So this, uh, so this is what we had done. Uh, we did a, uh, uh, the fibula osteotomy allowed the fibula to overlap, and we did the debridement at the pseudoarthrosis side, and did an onlay graft from the contralateral uh, tibia. And this was at about 15 months follow up, and uh, this seemed to have united well. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, now this is a five years follow up. You know, after the first surgery, the child was, uh, you know, nine years old at the time of the primary surgery, and now she's about fourteen years old, and now she started getting some problem at the level of the, you know, the foot and the subtalar joint, and uh, we had bent the nail, but what has happened is that the nail has migrated up despite the bend, and now it is lying at the level of the subtalar joint, and uh, she's having severe pain now, and. Uh, of re recent onset, she's you know even having difficulty in bearing weight on the left lower limb. So how would you approach now in this case? You know we want to get the implant out. Uh, firstly, how would you get it out? Number one and number two, you know once you take it out, you know with the pseudoarthrosis having healed solidly, would you still you know reimplant it or you can just do the implant removal and uh, forget it? If I may ask okay. you, how frequently do you follow up these children? With pseudarthrosis tibia after you got a union? Uh, I asked for a yearly follow up. This okay. child had, uh, you know, she, she was coming for a yearly follow up. So at the, at the point when you see the nail proceeding into the calcaneum, you could have pulled it out much easily. Okay. So you should have seen that. And the point is, I use a 
formal rush nail where it's got a hook. So migrating into the calcaneum almost never occurs. Okay. Uh, so if you've got a gentle curve like this, it, it, it can recede inside. So okay. the only thing is, we don't know how much, how damaged the subtalar joint is, right? If it is damaged and you think that the cartilage or whatever is destroyed, then you might end up having to do a subtalar fusion at some point in time. Otherwise, you can try to extract this, this, this nail, cut off that hook, the, ten, the, the, the bent part, and tap it right into the tibia. Okay. Dr. Crawford, your comments? Yes, yes. First of all, the, the subtalar joint has is lost. You can see the windshield wiper effect on the end of the rod there. So whatever you do, you're going to have to put a bone peg in there because you're going to get, you, you need a, a, uh, a talocalcaneal fusion in this child to take away the symptoms regardless of what you do otherwise. I would probably direct my attention to one, you've got a well-defined canal there in terms of, I would re-implant it. I would never at this point take uh, the implant out and leave it. That's failure. That's another operation, another failure waiting to happen. But I would, I, I think I could extract the, 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 uh, the rod. Uh, and I think you can put a filler, you can put a wire up from either above or below. This shell is good for some type of locking nail that you could put in to replace this and take it out of the ankle. Her ankle is still going to be a little weak. You notice how parotic the bone is down there. So she's going to have ankle stiffness and may have pain for a while, even though you do that and all of those things work. But that would be my, I would do, a, I, I, I would uh, 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 get a portal into the calcaneus, actually see the pin and guide from above and below, and whatever type is the orthopediatrics or whatever you use here to do it. That's what I would do at this particular time. Uh, because I don't trust a dysplastic bone. As I said, I've gotten away from a pseudoarthrosis and it's dysplasia, it's intrinsic, and it's a it's an accident waiting to happen. And that would be that would be my recommendation. So this is what we did. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we didn't re-implant the tibia. Uh, we did a corticotomy at the level of the nail tip proximally. And uh, through that cortical window, we hammered the nail out through the ankle and uh, subtalar joint. And uh, she was fairly comfortable after the uh, you know implant removal in terms of her ankle and foot pain. But as you said, you know we didn't re-implant the tibia, and that was a mistake. Which is next slide, please. Uh, yeah, we already discussed that, and uh, this is what happened. Yeah, this is almost yeah, yeah. This is almost, uh, you know, about nine months after the uh, the implant removal, and she comes back with the pain in the, you know, in the leg, in the lower leg, and uh, the obvious thing has happened. So it was a mistake not to reimplant the TBR, right? Yes. Let, let, let's say, you know, I I was young at one time, but and I think I didn't pay enough attention to old men with gray hair like Dr. Joseph and myself. And I did think, thinking how great I was as a surgeon, I'd be able to pull it off and prove them wrong. Um, it's not going to work. So <laughs> I would leave it. I don't feel at this point in my life, regardless of what procedure we've done to the tibia, if it's perfectly healed, not perfectly healed, there will be an intramedullary strut in that when I'm done. OK. Uh, it's as easy as that. Can we just see the full x-ray, please? Okay. Uh, can you remove the? Uh, so uh, Dr. Joseph over here, again, now if you see, uh, you know, there is a slight bow, there is a bowing of the tibia proximally at the junction of the proximal third and the middle third. And putting an intramedullary nail probably is not going to be possible unless you do an osteotomy over here. So what would you do? You know, what, would, what options would you suggest in this case? I don't know. As far as I'm concerned, I'd like to get an intermediate rod in somehow. Okay. I so, am not happy with other fixation devices. So can we go to the next slide, please? And uh, this is actually what we did. You know, we, we put in the bone graft, uh, breaching uh, the tibia and the fibula, uh, to achieve a tibia-fibula cross-union. 
and uh, be put in a plate rather than putting in a uh, a nail uh, dr crawford your comments on this uh... well they they the same as before i i would use and even though the bone looks to be very hard and chirotic i i would use uh, i i think a reamer could could probably get you as much into the canal as you needed to to stabilize it ab ab above and below uh, I, I, that, that I, I would still use a fixation with an intramedullary rod. You've used this. Now, it, it looks as an excellent position, but now I see the potential for a stress riser above where the plate At the tip is. of the plate. So right. that bothers me. The bone is parotid. The other thing that someone mentioned, go, go back to that one. Go, go back to that. The kinematics of the joint. I, I think we've got to look at everything. Look at the slant of the proximal tibia. And then the condyles, the condyles have less of an arc. So there's not gonna be normal knee motion here regardless of what we do. And that's gonna put stress on what we have. So I think something intermedullary would be and fixation above and below would be what I would have done. And uh, seeing this, I, I think there's gonna be an opportunity to do it. Okay. So the message from both the experts is that, uh, you know, uh, intramedullary nail is is absolutely mandatory in case of a CPT, and you wouldn't recommend a plate fixation. Anyway, next slide. Um, so and one uh, question which we have, uh, Sanjeev, just a uh, minute. Yeah. Um, what would you do if you get a proximal pseudoarthrosis? That is something which is not covered yet, and we have been asked to ask uh, this question. Congenital pseudoarthrosis of TBI in proximal term. Which is not very common. I have had it is, it is it is so uncommon that we don't have a good strategy. Meaning that I don't I don't have a strategy. I am always worried. I like to go high up into the flare of the metaphysics uh, with fixation and because I'm I worry about that, but I've not seen it. The other thing that that we've seen, because we are aggressive in that area is a so-called Cosens phenomena. You know, if you operate on the proximal portion of the tibia, especially in a child, you'll get a progressive valgus deformity. So we need to stabilize it above that. But um, this I worry about, the increase in cortical density, the proximal that's over your plate. I worry about the area over your plate. And uh, I'm concerned that you we still may have an opportunity at some point to go and, uh, and, and do something about it. Right. So the girl is now almost, you know, 17 years old. And as you said, you know, we, we, we need to keep a close watch at the, uh, at the nail, at the tip of the plate, at the proximal tip of the plate. Yeah. So this is, this is the latest follow-up. The girl is now about 17 years old. Thanks, Sandeep. Uh, so we have one more question that um, due to long-term effects of substances like BMP and bisphosphonates, uh, would you recommend them or will you not recommend them then use in uh, pseudoarthrosis? The feature question. Because uh, there are side effects of BMP and bisphosphonates, would you recommend their use or you will not recommend their use? Is that for Dr. Joseph or myself? Anyone, sir. Uh, Dr. Alvin, you can start. Okay, I'm keen, I'm keen on bisphosphonates, and, and I, don't, I don't understand it. I don't know whether it's the tech, you know, these are so unique that sometimes you just get a good result and sometimes you don't. Uh, I can say, though, that I've been in the business long enough to see some of my patients operated at four or five years of age who have subsequent tumors, but tumors are quite common in older neurofibromatosis patients. So I think that the healing has been better. Now, I've not gotten into bisphosphonates. I don't use a, a, a resorption. I don't use that at all. But I would, um, I, I, I have been, and I would continue to use BMP2. So uh, last question to Dr. Joseph. What is the experience with trans ankle nail in respect to ankle movements, possibility of arthritis and deformity and need for arthrosis at or after adolescence? I, I beg your pardon if I didn't hear the beginning. So, what, what are the side effects of transfixing ankle in long term? Well, the, the, undoubtedly there is a, this a downside of transfixing the ankle and subtalar joint. There will be some stiffness. 
And we've seen that some of those that we have removed once we've got sound union and passed the, the, the nail into the, into the tibia so that it's no more crossing the ankle joint, a fair amount of ankle motion comes back. And so we've looked at the function of the ankle at skeletal maturity. And we found that those that we have removed the rod, uh, you know, removed as in uh, the part that is across the ankle, if you remove that and tapped it higher up, they function reasonably well. But yes, there is a downside. But I think you've got to take it in, you know, everything in perspective because you are doing this for a very difficult condition to cure. And I think that some compromise is sometimes necessary in terms of function because at least he's got a leg to walk on, albeit maybe a stiff ankle. Yes, Dr. Crawford, you want to I'm add sure something? That you should, you, I, I would be concerned about fusing the ankle for all the reasons that he recommended. But in addition to that, the bowel mechanics and push off, and as you tend to use the lower extremity, then you're going to have that force. And that force, if it can't uh, uh, allow the articulation of the ankle, is going to be concentrated in the bone that's potentially a failure. And so you're going to put more stress into the area of the tibia dysplasia uh, if you don't have ankle motion, even if it's enough to, to just allow some swing into the normal bowel mechanics of gait. Uh, it doesn't mean that, you know, you're going to have full, but I would, uh, I, I would, uh, would not recommend, a uh, better still, I would recommend against fusion of the ankle in a human being. Yeah. So thank you very much, both of you, sir. We had an excellent session. I think we can go on for a very long but we'll have to end this. Uh, with this, I thank both of you from um, Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India. Yes, that uh, it was a wonderful uh, um, lecture on how to go about these things and what happens in long term. Um, unfortunately, probably many of us will not be able to follow up children because these children are going to go away from us because we don't have any transition centers. So I don't know what is going to happen in, to the kids which we have operated. But I'm sure that one thing we have learned is that never say that uh, the story is over. There is always something there in waiting. So thank you once again. Um, and uh, I think we'll end the meeting uh, with this. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day, Dr. Crawford. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the wonderful.